This is a new Porsche 935, and it's one of the most exclusive and expensive cars on the planet. This is a Porsche race car that isn't street legal, and they're only building 77 of these for the entire world. This one has a sticker price of just under $1 million. And today, I'm going to take you on a tour of this car and show you what you get. I've borrowed this 935 from Manny Koshbin, an entrepreneur here in Newport Beach in Southern California who has an amazing fleet of exotic cars. Manny also has a YouTube channel, the name is on the screen right now, and there's a link in the description below for you to subscribe, and you should subscribe because he's often posting amazing videos with his incredible cars. Manny also recently launched a mentorship program called Manny Koshbin Millionaire Mentorship, and I will link that in the description below so you can check it out also. So let's talk 935. The new 935, this car, was created as a tribute to the original Porsche 935 of the late 1970s and early 1980s, which was one of Porsche's most popular and successful race cars. Probably the most memorable original 935 had huge rear bodywork and a giant rear spoiler resembled a whale tail, and so it earned the nickname Moby Dick. And that's the 935 that this car is trying to resemble. This car is based on the latest Porsche 911 GT2 RS, but taken to the extreme. It has the same 690 horsepower engine as the GT2 RS and the same transmission, but this is a race car with a completely different interior and a lot of other upgrades. Most importantly, it's just incredibly exclusive. Like I mentioned, only 77 of these made for the entire planet with a sticker price for this car of just under a million dollars. And today I'm going to show you what that money buys you aside from an ultra rare modern interpretation of a race car icon. And I'm gonna start by taking you on a tour of this car and showing you all of the interesting quirks and features. All right, I'm going to start the crooks and features of the 935 with getting in, where the first thing you notice is just how light the door is. It's unbelievable. It can't weigh more than a couple of pounds. I've never felt a car door this light before. And it gives you some clue about how stripped down this thing is for serious racetrack use. In fact, there's not even a door stopper like there is on all road cars to keep the door open. It just sort of opens and closes depending on precisely what angle the car is sitting on. They didn't feel like adding the weight to put that thing in. And when you get inside, you can see just why this door is so light, because there are absolutely no frills to this door panel. No leather armrests, no storage area for your wallet, nothing. You don't even get power windows, and in fact, the windows don't even roll down. They're fixed in place in order to save weight and maybe for safety, and because you don't really need to roll down the windows on a racetrack. In fact, this door is so basic, it doesn't even have power locks or any locks at all, which is rather weird because the key is just a normal Porsche key, the same one you'd get if you went out and leased a new Macan. But there's a lock and unlock button. They have no function because this car has no locks. You will also see a trunk opener button on the key. It too has no function because this car has no trunk. Seems weird this car didn't get its own distinctive key, but it didn't. Now, if you're inside the car and you want to get out, you pull on this little plastic latch and that unlatches the door and you can open it up and climb out. If you're inside the car and you want to close the door, you pull on this red fabric loop and then the door closes. That's basically it. There is only one luxury on this door panel and that would be power mirrors. You can see the control here and that's because the windows don't go down. So if you're racing, you can't exactly roll down the window and adjust the mirror. So the power mirror switch is there. And by the way, speaking of the power mirrors, it's worth noting 
that the mirrors themselves come from the Porsche 911 RSR race car, also a purpose-built race car, shares mirrors with the 935. Now to get in, I have to take off my shoes, not because we're worried about it getting dirty, but because they're rather large and they'll hamper the whole process. I also have to remove the steering wheel, which you do by pulling this gold tab on the back of the steering wheel. This is pretty common in race cars to make it easier to get in and out. You pull it off, you kind of put it away, and then you have a little more room to climb inside. And then, <laughs> wish me luck, everyone. Oh. No problem at all. Now, once you're inside, the very first thing you notice is the seats, which are incredibly tight and huggy. These are actually FIA compliant race seats, and they laugh at your sport bucket seats and your GT3 RS that those people are so proud of. These things are way more supportive, more narrow than those seats because they're actual race seats designed to completely keep you in place. So if you have an accident, your head won't go flying around. You could break your neck. These seats are legit. And next up, another item worth noting that goes well above what you'd get in your regular Porsche 911 GT variant you have a roof hatch. Yes, that's right. Take a look on the roof. You can see there's a little cutout over the driver area. That's to get out in case the doors are compromised. You have an accident, the bodywork is askew, the doors don't open. You have another way out through that escape hatch. The only thing is it's secured in place with like eight individual fasteners. So if you have an accident, your car's on fire, you're not gonna exactly sit here and undo each one, hoping that you have enough time to get out the roof hatch. Seems like kind of an odd thing, but it's there as an extra point of escape if you need it. And next up, one other item worth noting, this car is sold new with only one seat. It's a single seater car. It's intended to be a race car. You're setting lap records in. You don't need a passenger. With that said, Porsche is not crazy. They offer a second seat as an option. And the owner of this car, Manny, decided to get the second seat. As you can see, it's in place. The cost was about $13,000 just for a passenger seat. But I guess that's what it costs to manufacture and ship a passenger seat that's FIA compliant with all the safety equipment to make sure your passenger also doesn't get injured on the racetrack. And next up, we move on to all of the interior quirks and features in the 935. And I wanna start with the starting procedure, which is quite unusual. To begin, it's the same as every other Porsche. Over to the left of the steering wheel, you insert the key and twist it but then nothing happens. You then have to go into the center control stack. There's this little red flap. Open it up and there's a switch underneath it. Push it down and that turns on the car's fuel pump, all of its accessories, and then it's ready to be started. Then go back over to the left of the steering wheel to the starter, twist the key, and the car roars to life. Take a listen to a cold start from a Porsche 935. And next up, once you get the car on, as you look around this interior, you'll discover that it's a curious mix of stuff you'll find in every other Porsche model, including base Boxsters, and stuff you'll only find in full-on race cars. I'm gonna start with the center control stack. The typical Porsche screen has been ripped out, and instead you have these controls mounted on this carbon fiber piece. And I already showed you that ignition switch over to the left. In the middle, you have the hazard lights. That button turns orange when the car is on, so you know how to activate it. And over to the right, you have a red button with an E. I believe that is the car's fire suppression system. So if you're on a racetrack, you get in an accident, the car catches on fire, you press that, and there's a fire suppression system built into the car that will spray fire suppression material to try to stop the fire. Now, still in the center control stack, but below those controls, over on the left, you have a little dial that's marked ABS. With this car, you can adjust the intensity and the force of the anti 
airlock braking system, including turn it all the way off if you want to. And below that dial, there's a little label printed down here that actually gives you a guide for when you're supposed to use each different level of ABS. You can see there are 11 different levels, ranging from slick and dry and robust at one, all the way up to wet and sensitive at 11. Again, something for serious racetrack drivers. Now, next to the ABS dial, you have another thing you won't find in a regular 911, and that would be your traction control intensity. You can see here, you have the option of turning on the wet traction control, you can turn it all the way off, and you can turn off your stability control with these four sort of square buttons in the middle of your center control stack. Now, interestingly, below this race car panel in the middle of this vehicle, you have climate controls. And in fact, they're the regular climate controls you have in basically every other Porsche model. You can adjust the temperature, you can put it on automatic, <laughs> you have a different passenger and driver side temperature. It's the same climate controls from every other vehicle right below a race panel that allows you to <laughs> choose from 11 different levels of anti-lock braking intensity. Now next to those climate controls you have the shifter. This car is equipped with Porsche's PDK system just like the G GT2RS on which it's based, and you can see the top of the shifter is wood, which is a really cool look, and it memorializes a few iconic Porsche models, like the 917 race car, which also had a wood shifter, and the Carrera GT, which does too. Now next up, over on the passenger side of the interior, a few interesting items over here. One, on the dashboard you have this plaque that says 935, and it tells you what limited edition number your particular 935 is. There's also this cool outline of the car. Also notable are the items in the footwell. You have the battery in here. It's huge. It takes up an enormous portion of the footwell. And you have the fire suppression system canister in here, which takes up even more of the footwell. As uncomfortable as it is in this car for the driver, it's even less comfortable for the passenger because so much of the footwell is stolen away. And you can see why this car is sold with only a driver's seat, unless you really want another seat. And next up, another interesting item in here, back to the center console, you have the headlight switch for this car. Typically you see this near the steering wheel in Porsche models, they've moved it to the center console, but it is the exact same headlight switch you'd find in a lot of other Porsche models, just in a completely different place. And yes, this car has automatic headlights, apparently anyway, because there's an auto portion of the headlight switch. And next we move on to probably the most notable item in this interior, which would be the gauge cluster, which has all of the displays and information for pretty much everything you'll need to know about this car. This gauge cluster was borrowed from the 911 GT3R, which is also a race car. They installed it in here too. The first thing you notice about the gauge cluster when the car starts is the rev counter. You don't have a gauge, but instead an actual display in numbers of exactly what your revs are. And you can see it is changing quite a bit as the engine revs change. Now, speaking of those printed numbers for the rev counter, it's worth noting that there are numbers for all of the information readouts for this car. There are no gauges like on road cars. Instead, exact numbers are in this gauge cluster. So you're on a racetrack, you can just look and see precisely what all of your readouts are, and you don't have to try to interpret a gauge or a graph, which you might do in a road car where you have more time to react. And next up, another item I love in that gauge cluster. In the lower left corner, you have the Porsche logo. <laughs> Even though it's digital, the whole thing is digital, but they just want to remind you once again, you have a Porsche in case you've forgotten. And next up, we have to move back over to the steering wheel. Now to get it back into place, you pull on that little gold tab behind the wheel, line it up, and then you can snap it right back into place. First, one interesting item worth noting about the steering wheel, specifically, it isn't really a wheel. You can see it's kind of circular, but the top half is completely cut off. That's to facilitate an easier line of sight to that gauge cluster screen, which is so important. They just lose the top half of the steering wheel so you can see it better. And I mentioned the steering wheel here because the wheel works in direct conjunction with the gauge cluster to provide you with more information and other capabilities. For example, one button on the steering wheel says pit. If you press that, it pulls up a large display that shows a pit timer. So you know exactly how much time you've spent in the pit lane, how much time you've lost on the racetrack. It also shows your miles per hour in very large print because some pit lanes have a speed limit and you might want easy access to that information. Next up, over on the 
left side of the steering wheel, you have a button marked ACK, A-C-K, which stands for Acknowledge. So you can see there's a warning up on the gauge screen right now saying low fuel. You press ACK and it acknowledges the low fuel warning and then that warning goes away. And next up, another button on the steering wheel is DIS, D-I-S. You press that and you get a different information display with more car information, temperatures, that sort of thing. You can press DIS again to kind of cycle through both of the displays to see whatever it is you're curious about when you're on the racetrack. Now next up, around the gauge cluster, you can see there are a lot of different lights, little light circles on the left, right, and top. I presume these lights are there to guide you for when it's time to shift. You have shift paddles on the steering wheel, just like in so many other cars, and I presume those lights will turn green, yellow, red, and then you know it's time to pull the paddle and shift into the next gear. And next up around that gauge cluster screen, you do have two dials. On the left, you have the Sport Chrono display, like you have on a lot of Porsche models, which is a clock or a lap timer if you want it. And over on the right, you have a gauge that shows pressure, oil pressure, so you know where that is when you're driving the car. And next up, back to stuff you'd find in other Porsche models, the stalks coming off the steering column. Over on the right of the steering wheel, you have the wiper stalk, and it's the same wiper stalk in basically every other modern Porsche model. Over on the left, you have a cruise control stalk, which blows me away. I can't imagine this car actually has cruise control, but at least the stalk is there. And above that, you have the stalk for the turn signals which also might seem a little bit strange. But there is some logic to putting turn signals on a track car. You might signal when you're going into a pit lane, for instance, or you may have to put on your hazard lights to let other drivers know that your car is broken and you've become a hazard. So there are some purposes for it. And this car has some of the coolest turn signals of any car. They're mounted on the side of this giant rear wing pointing to the back and just look how cool they are, this LED bar going up, turning on and off. That is a really cool look, one of my very favorite turn signals ever. Now, you put on the headlights, and of course the taillights turn on back here, and they also share that space. You can see the taillights light up in red in the same spot. You're wondering, what if you put on the turn signal while the taillights are on, and it just sort of alternates from red to orange and red to orange, back and forth to let drivers know that your taillights are on, but your signal is also on. Now, interestingly, the brake lights are in a completely different place from the taillights and the turn signals. This car basically just has cool race car bodywork over the back of a regular 911 GT2 RS, and the brake lights are actually just the regular GT2 RS brake lights in the regular spot. They're sort of inside all of this cool, special 935 bodywork. Pretty far in there, but just your regular 911 brake lights, surprisingly. And next up, one other piece of lighting worth noting back here is in the middle, you have these 15 individual little lights. That's your fog light or your rain light for when you're driving on a foggy or rainy race course. You can turn that on with the headlight switch the same way you turn on the rear fog light in basically any other car, and then it turns on, lights up red so other drivers can see you and they don't hit you in bad weather conditions on the track. But probably this car's most unusual lighting system is up front. When you put on the turn signals up front, the whole front lighting assembly lights up as the turn signal. Very bright, nothing too unusual about that, except there's not another lighting assembly. So when you turn on the headlights, that same assembly lights up as the headlights. So of course, then you're thinking, well, what happens if you turn on the turn signal with the headlights on? The answer is they just alternate. It goes headlight, turn signal, headlight, turn signal. Now you gotta remember, this is a race car. There aren't exactly regulations saying that the headlight has to stay on when you turn on the turn signal. Porsche probably figured most people will only be using the turn signal for a very short period of time, so there's no problem problem with combining them, so they did. But you will not find that on a road car, obviously. And next up, moving on to some other exterior items in the 935, I want to move on to one of my very favorites. That would be this warning label printed on the windshield that says, CAUTION, RACE CAR. This vehicle is not eligible for registration or public street use. That is a fantastic warning label. You don't get that on your GT3 RS. Now, right below that, it says, CAUTION, the tires mounted at the time of delivery are meant for transport only and must not be used for testing or racing. Indeed, 
these are transport tires. And if you look at the tires, you can see they specifically say transport on them in several different places. Just as a reminder, these aren't actual racing tires. They're just used to move the car around on trucks, whatever. When you buy one of these, you're given a second set of tires, racing slicks, which of course are better on the racetrack, and a different set of wheels, which are intended to mimic the original wheels on the original 935. These tires really are just for temporary use transport when you're moving the car around from place to place. And by the way, you see this little hook coming off the center of the wheel? The transport wheels have that hook for an unusual purpose so the car can be easily secured on a flatbed or in a trailer. Just clip your straps to those hooks and it won't move around on a transporter, not a feature you're likely to see on the wheels of basically any other car. Next up, let's talk about that stuff you get when you buy this car, like the tires. This is a race car, not street legal, not sold through a dealership, so there's no window sticker with government mandated fuel economy disclosures. Instead, you get a little list from Porsche that says, this is what everything costs. And the owner of this car, Manny, showed me the list for this car. The base price is $829,000. Shipping is $52,000 thousand dollars. Then there's a spare parts package that costs $43,000 extra, which you're obligated to get if you buy the car so you can have spare parts in case you're racing it and you damage it and you need more parts. There's also a wrap. This car comes standard in bare carbon fiber and you can see on these vents exactly how it would look if you didn't wrap it in any color. Manny, this car's owner, chose to wrap it in this cool martini livery that was $27,500, bringing the grand total price of this car to $952,000, just shy of a million bucks. A lot of money for a car. And next up, we move on to some other interesting quirks and features on the outside of this car. One is in this little panel here behind the window on the passenger side. You can see there's this little blue thing with a piece sticking out. That's for the jacking system. You insert an air compressor in there and there are air jacks that will actually push the car up to make it easier to change the tires if you're a pit crew, just like a race car which makes sense because this is a race car. <laughs> Next to that, you have a little cap that says 935, and below that, distilled water only. You're supposed to put distilled water in there, obviously, and then this car has a water injection system that occasionally sprays water in hot pieces of the engine to keep it cool when you're doing hot track lap after track lap, or the engine could typically overheat. Now, given that this little cap on the side of the car is for water, you may be wondering where you put in gasoline fuel. That is done at the very center in the front of the car. This is the fuel cap and the fuel goes in here. Typically a pit crew would be doing this for you, but you can also put in your own race fuel. And next up, another cool feature on the outside of this car is the exhaust which look so cool, like rocket launchers behind this thing. This car doesn't have to conform to any emissions regulations since it's a race car, not street legal, and they can make the exhaust look like this, and it is just so cool looking. Apparently this exhaust design is a tribute to another Porsche race car from years ago, the 908, but regardless of where it comes from, it is amazing. And of course the exhaust sounds pretty good too. Here are a few revs for your enjoyment. And finally, to discuss the last interesting quirks about the 935, I want to talk about what separates this car from the GT2 RS. Because like I mentioned, it has the same engine as the GT2 RS and the same transmission. So you might be wondering, why would you pay a million dollars for this when you can pick up a GT2 RS for a lot less? Of course, the different bodywork is a component, the fact that it's a race car and the incredibly low production number, but there's more to it than just that. This car has improved brakes compared to the GT2 RS for far better stop power, and like I showed you, you can dial in your ABS force with that switch in the interior. This car is also 300 pounds lighter than a GT2 RS for a total curb weight of about 3,000 pounds, a little over. That's a big deal because the GT2 RS is already way lighter than basically every other 911. To take even more weight out of it, it's pretty impressive. This car also has a fuel cell in it, which is a special kind of fuel tank designed for use on race cars. And this car has a 30 gallon fuel cell, which means you can do a lot of track laps before you have to come into the pits 
for more fuel. And of course, you also have the rear wing, which is absolutely massively insane. Undoubtedly the largest rear wing I've seen on one of the cars I've reviewed, but this is a race car. They have large rear wings for better downforce. It's not that unusual in the race car world. Still huge to see it here. Now it's worth noting that despite the special design of this car, the styling, the rear wing, it isn't intended for any particular race series. Instead, it's just a race car that owners can do whatever they want with, go racing in whatever series they can qualify for, or just enjoy on private racetracks whenever they want, or more likely just sit in a garage under a cover. And finally, I want to briefly discuss some of the accessories you get along with your 935. This is just a small portion of what comes along with your car. And I'm not going to go through everything in depth here, but you get these Porsche cases that have extra parts in them. Some of the stuff is for racing. You can open it up. You have your little fuel filler to put fuel in at the racetrack. You have your little tool that'll help undo your center lock wheels. And it just kind of goes on and on. You have compartment after compartment full of all sorts of different stuff. And again, this is only a small portion of what comes along with the 935. You get a lot of different accessories. Then again, you'd expect to for a million dollars. And so those are the quirks and features of the 935. But now I want to talk to the car's owner a little bit about the 935 experience so far. So this is Manny Koshpin. Thank you for having me back here. My pleasure. Let's talk 935. So how do you know, first off, that you've been, there's only 77 of these. How do you know that you're one of the 77? How do they tell you? Well, I was sitting one afternoon at my house and smoking a, a nice cigar and I got an email and it was directly from Porsche in Germany. And I opened it and it had, the title was 935. So I figured, oh, it's a decline letter because of course I've been inquiring about it. Right. I mean, it is a legendary car, right? Right, right. And there is 77, as you know, I, I like exclusivity right. in my car collection. And I opened it and I start reading it. I'm like, the first sentence says, well, sometimes it's luck, sometimes it's fate, but we were able to secure you at 935. I'm like, what? So you were, off my chair. you were already pretty interested in the car yeah. from the beginning, but they made 918, 918 Spiders, and then from that, they have to kind of whittle down to 77. Do you have any idea yeah. why they picked you? Do, you? do you know any more than this? Do you care? I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I do love the Porsche brand. Um, I'm very expressive, but passionate about the car brands that I really love, Porsche being one of them. So I'm on social media. And right, right, right. I love my Carrier GT, my GT2 RS. Um, my 918, so I think I've bought, you know, nine or ten Porsches uh, in the past ten years. So they, the, Germany sends you an email. Porsche yes. in Germany sends you an email. And then you say yes, obviously. Are you kidding? <laughs> yes! So After I caught my breath. <laughs> so then, yeah. this so being a race car, I mean, it's not even street legal, the, pr the process is very different. So walk me through kind of the process of ordering it and, and sure. all that. Yeah, so it comes with lots of options, different livery design. Of course, I went, uh, as you can see, with the classic Martini mm -hmm. because it's a legendary car. I didn't want to put my own touch into it. It's, you don't touch cars like Did this. Did they, would they have allowed you? Like, could you have done whatever you wanted? No. Okay, there, no. Were, there were certain things you could do. Absolutely. Okay. So this car comes <laughs> at no charge. It comes with full exposed carbon fiber. But then they give you four or five, maybe actually more than five, uh, different designs with the wrap. So this whole car is a wrap, it's right. paint. And I went with the classic martini because I think it's such a legendary car, the Moby Dick as it's known, and right. this uh, design is like iconic right. for this car. So, so there's no configurator. Do you just like no. email back and forth with yes. some dude? And then That's right. Goes, yeah. okay. <laughs> That's what, this is what happens when you're an ultra yeah. VIP. You just actually it was a girl. Okay, okay. <laughs> but you're talking to someone at yeah. Porsche and just say, "Yeah, this is what I want. This is what I want." Yeah. And this is special enough that there's just like a person assigned to exactly. So <laughs> after Germany assigns you that beautiful letter that they email you. After Germany emails you that beautiful, awesome letter, they hand you over to Porsche North America Motorsports, and you just uh, uh, coordinate from there. Well, so, so that letter was like a year and a half ago, so it yeah. took that long before you finally yes. can't shade up. Tell me about the delivery of this vehicle. Oh, delivery is interesting. So I, first I get a big pallet, right? Two pallets. I'm like, oh, you got the wrong address. I was like, no, this is from <laughs> Porsche. No, I was like, Porsche, yeah. So I figured they shipped me the car in pieces. <laughs> but then I, then, I, then I read the uh, shipping slip, it says spare parts. 
So I figured, oh, okay, the car's in one piece still. And then the tow truck came a few hours after that. Okay, so the pal these, yeah. are, these are delivered separately. You actually got, so, yeah. so in the, the spare parts is like, obviously the wheels so, and tires. Wheels, fenders, uh, front spoiler. I think you have an extra hood. Okay, <laughs> so if you like damage it or something on the yeah, track, you're yeah, set. Yeah. Okay. yeah, pretty cool. And it comes with big uh, crates of tools and wow. all kinds of stuff, yeah. I mean, so if you yeah. run into issues with this car, you can't yeah. exactly take it to Porsche of Irvine or Porsche nope. powered Porsche Newport Beach. That's yeah. not gonna happen. What, no. what is the process for dealing with it? Well, they recommend, uh, they'll go ahead and give you some uh, references where you can take it. So lucky for me, GMG Motorsports is down the street, literally down the uh, street. And they actually have a 935. Oh, really? Yeah, the owner um, has a 935 oh, well, in exposed car. This is the magic of Southern California. Yeah. <laughs> so and, anything and is around. He has race cars, they race cars at the thermal. So uh, lucky for me, they recommended James, GM, uh, GMG. Actually, I had to install the passenger seat and uh, I had to take it over there. Was that the most ridiculous thing throughout this process, the $13,000 uh, passenger seat? Mm, no, shipping was $52,000. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Why was yeah. shipping $52,000? Did they well, trade it on I'm a guessing, plane? Uh, well, yes, it came over with it on a plane, and I'm guessing the, the spare parts is like shipping Right, cars. sure, of course, that makes sense. And you know, insurance probably on the plane. And it's, it's super low, it's, it's a, you don't want to make well, a mistake, you got a wing. The, yeah. So now that you have this car, what do you do with a car like this? You can't well, drive it on the road. No, you can't, and I'm not about to risk it. Yeah. But the uh, only, only way to enjoy is on a track. Yeah. So I got to carve out two or three days uh -huh. in my busy life and uh, plan a track day. And so that's the new Porsche 935. Obviously, I can't drive this car because it isn't street legal. And generally, I don't review cars that I can't drive. But given how rare this car is and how unlikely it is that I'll ever be able to track one down and set up a racetrack where I can really experience it, I figured I would settle for this thorough tour of this amazing Porsche. And next up, it's time to move outside the 935, which means unfortunately, getting out. <laughs> Here goes. <laughs> <laughs>